Uh, I want to introduce myself. I'm Sheila Siemens. I'm the director of the Noyo Center for Marine Science. This is our Science Talk series, and we're super excited to have Sean Meyer Steele here with us um, to talk about some really interesting technology that will be tested off our coast. We're really excited about hearing about this incredible new technology. Um, uh, Decel has always been, as you know, a, a rather controversial topic um, on the, in the state of California. And um, Onika Technologies has come up with a really innovative design that uses wave power to bring in fresh water from the ocean. And so um, I'm, I'm excited to hear more about this and, and hear how it, it uh, addresses some of the bigger issues around desal and potentially offers a solution in this realm of blue economy. So the Noyo Center has been participating with the city. I'm going to introduce Sarah in a minute um, and other mem other partners, the Harbor District, the college, the tribes, to um, better understand what a, a West Business Development Center, to better understand what a blue economy could look like uh, here on the Mendocino Coast. Um, we're particularly interested because we want to build, as you know, the Ocean Science Center out on the Fort Bragg headlands. And how can that center be sort of a, a hub for blue economy and, and be supported um, through a lot of these different endeavors? Uh, so, so we're really excited about anything that's looking at how to use the oceans more sustainably to address our societal needs. And as we move forward with climate change and, and increasing uh, drought issues, this may be an option for not 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 only just our coast, but um, other places in California. So before we get into Sean's talk, I wanted to Sarah. She's as I said a partner in this group we're calling the Noyo Ocean Collective, um, and she wants to talk to you briefly about another project. All these projects are somewhat um, related uh, on the blue economy front. So Sarah McCormick, City of Fort Bragg, take it away. <clears throat> Thank you, Sheila. Uh, so yes, everything that Sheila said, we're we're really proud to be part of this uh, collective group that's looking at how to develop a coast, a climate resilient coastline that's looking at our ecosystems. So we have healthy ecosystems and also our economy and the quality of life here. Uh, so we're really we're all working and doing our part and pulling our weight. This particular um, project is really interesting. Uh, it came up. And I'm sure Sean will probably touch on this, but you remember when when our ho when so much had to close down around here because there was we were right in the midst of the drought and there was frontline pages on the headlines all over the place about Mendocino Coast and and our lack of water that caught their Onika's attention because they they really are pursuing this this, this responsible way of providing fresh water and for us being a coastal community that was an interesting match. They also caught wind of the symposium that we were doing in partnership with the Noya Center and all the other collective members a year ago in May when we looked when we did the Blue Economy Symposium and Learning Festival. And so when Onika came and into our community, and the the, the reality is, is they came into a community that is is open to innovation, is opening, is open to trying to create a climate resilient coastal community to, as Sheila said, responsibly use our marine resources. And this is a really interesting project. Um, Sean's gonna get into it, but basically the city partnered to receive grant funds from the state of California's Department of Water Resources. And we're pursuing a two tier permitting strategy. So we're first looking at Part in assisting in a demonstration pilot project that's going to move fairly quickly so we can really see what the results are and what this technology and how it interacts with our environment. And then on simultaneously pursue a long term larger deployment uh, where this can actually stay in our in our water and be part of our water strategy. So I'm really excited that you coordinated this meeting, Sheila, and that we're using we're getting the science talk out. And I'm going to be here the whole time because there's so much to learn about Onika's technology, and I find it fascinating. And so with that, I'm going to introduce Sean, who I disappeared. There you are, Sean. Hi. I'd Hi. like to introduce Sean to just re to tell you all more about Onika's desalination buoy. 
Thank you, sir. That was a fabulous introduction and a great introduction of the project and the overview of um, exactly what our involvement is and why we're here. So thank you for that. Thank you everyone for uh, tuning in or, cl or, or clicking in or just joining. And, <laughs> and definitely um, thank the Oil Center, Sheila, for, for hosting this um, so that we can have this 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 discourse and kind of share with the with the greater community exactly what our what we intend to do. So without um, further ado, I'll start sharing and present um, what we are hoping to do. Okay, can everyone see the um, can everyone see the screen pretty well? Yes, but we can see all of your screens, so we're we're not oh. seeing the. Um... There you go. That's perfect. <laughs> Fantastic. Okay. Um, so we've, we understand that there is a, a fair amount of the audience here that uh, are Spanish speaking. So um, we couldn't get the technology to do the translation to the words really well. So most of the presentation has the subtitles in both Spanish and English. So it's a little bit, a lot on the screen, but to try to accommodate um, both folks who are speaking in Spanish and English, um, uh, towards the, if you have any questions in Spanish, please put them into the chat. Um, I, I am bilingual, so I will, um, at the end, be able to answer any questions in Spanish. If there are any questions in Spanish as we go along, please feel free to, to present them, and I'll do my best to, to answer. Um, so I, I won't go into too much. This is how this is sort of broken down. Um, we're looking at the recent history, the water situation city of Fort Bragg, which you all know much better than we do. Um, we'll talk a little bit about desalination. We'll talk a little bit about wave power desalination, uh, a bit about Onika, uh, and then we'll update where we are with um, this, uh, the proposed wave power desal pilot. And then we'll sort of look and see how we believe this could be beneficial to the city of Fort Bragg. <laughs> So um, again, not going too much into the this history. You all know um, much better than than we do um, the, the history of the water situation. Where historically, um, the city of Fort Bragg has been dependent upon rainfall and river water for the water supply. Um, the geology of the hydrogeology of the city doesn't allow for a ton of of storage in, ter in terms of wells. Um, there have been a few repetitive droughts that have strained the water supply, um, and in which case there's been some required ex pretty expensive trucking. Um, we know you guys have installed a brackish desalination plant not too long ago to help um, stabilize the water situation. But we also know that you guys are looking for something that's really stable, uh, more importantly, affordable and sustainable in terms of the long term water supply. So as as was mentioned by Sarah, you know, we um, we came down to kind of hear more about what was going on, and we learned about the Blue Economy Initiative that was being undertaken by the city and looking to achieve these really extraordinary goals of ocean resiliency, utilization of renewable energy, um, aquaculture, sustainable fishing, uh, protection of the ocean systems, clean tech, emissions reduction, and promoting jobs in the environmental sphere. And and for us, this checked all the boxes it really met all of the things that are part of our vision and mission statement as a company so we said we really love to be involved and we think we have a solution that could be a good fit into what you all are, are, are working towards so um as sheila mentioned reverse osmosis is pretty controversial in california for a few different reasons but if you just look at the real basis of it what is reverse osmosis. So osmosis is a process that takes place in nature, where if you have two things of, of dissimilar concentrations, like a salty water solution and a water solution that's not salty, and you put them together separated by a semi-permeable membrane, which, by the way, your stomach is a, an example of a semi-permeable membrane, which allows certain things to go through, but other things to not go through. In the case of a semi-permeable membrane used in reverse osmosis, it allows the water molecules to go through, but not the salt molecules to go through. So if you put two bodies of water together separated by a membrane like this, naturally, the water, the, the concentrated solution would draw the, the, the 
the less concentrated solution through that membrane barrier until they were the same um, concentration, until that's called reaching equilibrium. That's forward osmosis, that's normal osmosis, that takes place in nature with trees, inside of our bodies, in a lot of places. What reverse osmosis is, is if you apply pressure to that brine, to that concentrated um, solution of, of salt water, and you, it would force through that membrane only the fresh water, so the fresh water would go through, and the, con the salts remain behind. So that's reverse osmosis, and that's the technology we're talking about here. How that's typically done um, commercially, and this is a technology that's pretty mature. I mean, I personally have been involved in desalination projects all around the world. Um, it's typically done where you have a, a generator, um, which is typically fed by um, fuel, some typically fossil fuel. You generate electricity. That electricity drives a motor. That motor drives what we call a high pressure pump for seawater to to get that pressure to the water, to force the water through the membrane, leaving behind the salt and creating fresh water. That's what a typical um, desalination, seawater desalination plant, how it operates. Presently, about 1% of the global population utilizes desalination. Um, that's projected by 2050 because of a, a few different vari variables because of the growth of the population, because of the degradation of, of water supplies, because of climate change, which is also affecting water supplies, that's, a, that's predicted to go up to 10% of the global population dependent upon desalination by 2050. And at that time, if we use traditional land-based desalination- They aren't all that, underwater. That, that, that's, <laughs> not that's fueled by um, fossil fuels, that would be creating CO2 emissions that are about twice the total aviation industry. And that's, that's a lot. So when we look at conventional desalination, solving that problem of providing water to people, which is absolutely necessary, particularly on coastal communities, if it's done utilizing uh, fossil fuels and generating greenhouse gases, it's contributing to climate change, which exacerbates the water scarcity issues. <laughs> But there's another way. Um, we see where you look at where this water is coming from, uh, the, sort, the, the seawater supply, and all of the energy on the waves, and particularly where you guys are in the Pacific, that water is just so energetic, it's just remarkable. So that proximity and that combination, we see as another way to solve that problem. So just really quickly, so how is wave power desalination different than traditional desalination. Uh, well, for one, we don't have to go through all of those energy conversion steps. We don't have to create energy in the form of electricity at all, which in general contributes to about 30 to 50% of the cost of operating a desal plant, the cost of the energy to go into it. So our version of, of utilizing desalination purely uses the wave, energy in the waves, to pump the water, to create enough of pressure to push them through reverse osmosis membranes to create fresh water. So no electricity, no greenhouse gases generated. So what does it look like? As Sarah mentioned, this pilot plant would install one single buoy, one single unit. That unit has the desalination equipment, everything on the unit itself. There's one pipeline that goes along the ocean floor that has that fresh water that goes to a local reservoir. Um, no greenhouse gas emissions, not utilizing any land space. Um, I'll go into this in a little bit more detail, but it's very low um, salinity brine. Um, we have a very um, safe design intake system to make sure we don't, um, we're not pulling sea life into the system. It's decentralized, so you don't have to build a big giant plant to get to a place where it's affordable. And it's also a very affordable system. Um, if we have time at the end, we've got a video that explains in detail and a little bit more technical detail exactly how the technology works. It's in English and Spanish. It's on our website at www.onicawater.com. But if we have time here at the end, we'll come back and um, we'll try to play that. Please 
if there's interest and there's time, please um, remind me and I'd be happy to, to show that. Or um, if there's not time or if there's not interest at the moment, um, please feel free at your leisure to, to come and look at the videos on, on the website um, at your leisure. So when one of the things we talk about um, avoided carbon emissions, and this has been uh, validated by international groups that do um, carbon uh, emission validation, is that compared to fossil fuel uh, power, even high efficiency D cell, so one meter cube per day, which is 250, about 250 gallons uh, of, of desalted water per day, in a year would produce a, between three quarters and one ton of CO2, which is pretty significant. If you look at the total water use, the average water use of the city of Fort Bragg, which is about a little bit less than a million gallons a day, um, that would be equivalent to if you had to produce that whole amount with uh, with fuel powered desalination, it would be about 3,000 tons of CO2 per year produced with traditional desal, or that much avoided using technology that, like Onika technology that is carbon free desalination. Um, one of the, of course, an issue we have a place as beautiful as um, the city of Fort Bragg, and I, I love your coastline. I absolutely enjoy walking along it. Is you know, what would be the impact, the visual impact um, on the shore? So typically the buoys are located somewhere between a mile and a half a mile offshore. And these are actually two installations and looking at where two, this project is here was off the coast of Nova Scotia. And that's actually our chief financial officer, Alain Desbois, who's looking at it. You can barely see it from the shore. And this is Onika's um, COO and founder and actually the, the creator of the technology, uh, Jurgen Tutic. And he's looking, he's happy, he's in Agorobo, Chile, where we have a pilot unit installed for about 18 months. And it's about half mile offshore. And you can see that's about the visibility, the visibility level. Um, and the city of Fort Bragg, it might be a bit higher. We're looking at being installed, we're hoping just offshore where your wastewater treatment plant is. And that's on a bit of a bluff, so that elevation will give you a little bit more of a visibility. But as you can see, it's it's a very low visual impact. Um, I mentioned earlier that we have what we call responsible brine, meaning that it's really low concentration brine. Um, a typical conventional desalination plant converts about 50% of the water it takes in into fresh water. Uh, we, and, with that rate of recovery, that rate of uh, percentage of, of, that produces a brine that's about 100 to 150% more salty than the typical, uh, than, the, than the average seawater. Because, and that's done to maximize efficiencies, mostly efficiencies related to the energy cost. Because we're not utilizing electricity, we don't have energy costs, we don't have those same constraints. So we do a much lower conversion so we only, our conversion is typically between 20 and 30%. So we have um, the seawater, our brine salinity is only about 30 to 50% higher than the seawater salinity, so much lower. And because we're not a big central plant, that's not all being released in one central area, each little buoy produces its own, um, uh, produces its own freshwater and its own um, uh, brine, which is released at the buoy itself, so it's pretty widely dispersed and low um, saline applications. So it's very quickly returned back to the salinity level of the ocean. Um, when we say that the units are designed um, to protect um, sea life, and this is a rendering of our smallest unit, which is our emergency deployment applications, we call it ice cube. As the intakes on the units where the water comes in, one, they're designed to have an incredibly low velocity, so there's not a big sucking effect into the intake. And two, they're designed with a very fine mesh design, which is about 60 microns in uh, the size of the intake holes. And to give you um, some, some sense of what that looks like, the average human hair, not mine obviously, but the average human hair is about 60 microns. So that's about the size of the holes in the sieve that the water is coming through. So it's very protective of ensuring that sea life doesn't get pulled into the system. 
Um, the units, because they are, can be decentralized, you don't have to go through the process of having to put in really large infrastructure. For example, if um, at the end of the day, uh, the city of Fort Bragg decided to put in a system, and let's say Mendocino um, next door thought, wow, this is working out pretty well, we'd like one too. You wouldn't have to run pipeline through that beautiful countryside to connect one city to the other. You could very easily put another decentralized system in front of uh, Mendocino and put saving, cutting down on a lot of infrastructure costs and, and time. Um, they're very portable units. Um, once they are, once we have the anchors into the water, and there is an anchor that's put into the water that they're connected to, you can disconnect and connect them back into the anchor at about time frame of about two hours you can do it. And we've done this many times in a number of different uh, installations. And you can see on the bottom, that's a, that's a full size unit. That's the same size unit of iceberg that we're proposing to go into Fort Bragg. And it's being towed, towed by a small Zodiac. Um, so just a little bit about Onika Technologies. Um, Onika is a relatively early stage commercial company, which is why we're doing a pilot um, in the first place. But it's not a new company. Uh, it's been in existence at this point about nine years. Um, it's we're on about our ninth version of the technology. Every single version was developed in the ocean and tested in the ocean. So these are not things that were done in a laboratory. As you can see there on the left, Onika is a Canadian company. That is a buoy that's off Nova Scotia in the wintertime, and you can see it's completely iced over. So it's been through. Um, a lot of different testing conditions as we've been developing the technology. Um, it is award-winning technology. Um, it what was it did it, we created that smaller version of the unit, the ice cube, and uh, because it was a call for action by the U.S. Department of Energy, which they called the Wave to Water Prize, where they wanted to have a technology that could be readily, quickly deployable, a small technology that didn't require uh, energy that could produce water after emergencies or for remote operations. And we actually, um, uh, amongst 70 participants, we were in first place one. We've also been recognized by our peers, the International Desalination Association, um, recognized uh, Omika as the most innovative technology in 2022. Um, we do presently have two size units, that small ice cube that you see there to launch for emergency applications. The iceberg unit, which you see in the middle, which is what we're proposing for the city of Fort Bragg. We are in process and we will have, we will be producing a number of what we call our utility scales, our glacier class unit, which produce about 10 times as much as the iceberg class unit. And those will be in production this year um, for larger applications. Um, two of our most recent and our longest term deployments, uh, one is in Florida, uh, in southern Florida. It's the same size unit, iceberg class unit that would, we would be deploying to Fort Bragg. Um, it's been, we've learned a lot of lessons from that. It's been a successful deployment. Um, we are actually on a different generation from that, from all the lessons learned from that operation. And their other longest deployment is in Agarobo, Chile, which is just off the coast from San Diego. Um, it's our pilot unit, um, 10, meter, 10 meters cube per day design, and it's been operating very successfully for a similar time, about 18 months as well. Um, I'm, I'm sure, uh, you know, being able to show you exactly what it looks like the op unit's operating would be um, interesting. And I do have two videos here. They're only about a minute each. And again, I will come back to these if we have time and if there is interest, they're in English and Spanish. Um, if we don't have time, again, and if you do have any interest or you'd just like to enjoy it at a later time at your leisure, you can just go onto our website, onikawater.com, and you could watch the videos at your own leisure just to see actual deployments. And there's the one in Chile and the one in Florida that are there. So um, coming down to where you guys are really into, what's the deal? What's the update on the city of Fort Bragg pilot? Um, which is called Resiliency, um, which we think is kind of a nice name for project. And I think you'll see that as we sort of um, start talking about the project more in a different format. So the Fort Bragg Wave Power Desal Pilot would utilize a single Onika Iceberg class unit. 
The length of the pilot is proposed for 12 months of operation. Um, this unit is designed to produce a nominal 50 meters cubed per day, which is about 13,000 gallons per day. It's about 20 feet diameter. Um, this is what it looks like. Their version two is a little bit different than this, but in general, you can get the idea. It's, it has uh, with it, it's designed with all of the safety features that uh, any ocean craft has. In the nighttime, it has a blinking light. It's registered with the Coast Guard. It's got um, um, reflective uh, radar for daytime use. It is registered its location with the Coast Guard and uh, uh, you know, all of the other authorities. Um, so it, it's designed for safety. It's got GPS on it. Um, it's got cameras. Uh, it's a it's essentially a small floating boat with a desal unit on it, except that it's not powered. Um, it consists of three parts. The main part is the buoy, which is the floating structure. It's everything is housed on top of the pumping system, the reverse osmosis system. The mooring system, which is an anchor on the ocean floor, which is connected to the, which is connected with a, a fair amount of tension to the buoy itself. That's what creates the, the pressurization as it goes up and down in the, in the ocean column. And then the permeate pipeline, which goes from the buoy itself to, uh, to a reservoir on the shore, in which case in Fort Bragg would be um, where the wastewater treatment plant is located. So you all are really familiar, I'm sure, with what Fort Bragg looks like. This is a little bit of an aerial view of that beach area that you guys have there and the wastewater treatment plant there just down to the bottom right. Um, we are proposing, and this has to be, this is being vetted by, I think at this point, 15 regulatory authorities for, um, for California and the city, for the county, for the state, and for the um, federal government to before it's uh, proved to be permitted there and but it would be located actually at this point it's with dog a little bit to the left we think it would be located someplace around here and i'll explain why that is in a second so um there's been a number of surveys of the current marine environment um and so basically that area is a mix of sandy plains among some rocky reefs um, there are various algae that grow there. It's mostly a lot of sea urchins, some red abalone. Um, a lot of the key algal species during the surveys were either absent or in very low densities, which is um, something we understand has been sort of a trend along northern California coastlines. But they were able to, with the mapping, and when they used three different methods, uh, uh, which I'll go into a little bit more detail, they were able to find just off that coast about a 6.3 acre of predominantly sandy substrate, which we'll call a bowl, which I'll show you in a second, um, which is just offshore of the wastewater treatment plant and seems to be suitable for placing a buoy mooring system that would have minimal risks to a really sensitive habitat. And there is a sand channel um, that extends from the bowl back to about where the wastewater treatment plant is, and that's primarily where the existing wastewater outfall line is. This is sort of what it looks like from a hydrological uh, mapping system. So this shows depths and contours. This whole area in between here is what they describe as a large sandy bowl with sand running along here. And this is about where we would hope to place the unit. And that's about the pathway that we would hope to bring it to with that last piece coming up to the beach going to the shore. So how would this be done? Um, basically, these are relatively small pipes, uh, a couple of inches. Um, we that once that pipeline has been that pathway has been laid out and it's been approved, um, it would be really closely adhered to. Um, hey, Sean, uh, can, I, can yes. I interrupt for a second? Your screen is really dim. Is it? Is that is that the case for others too? Like, oh no, just me? Okay, maybe it's fine. Go ahead, Sean. Sorry to interrupt. No, no Let's... worries, Sean. Thank you. I, I would hate to not be showing it. So yeah, thank you for the warning. Are we okay now? Yes. Yes, okay. So um, the, it would be unrolled um, from a pipeline that 
would be closely followed by divers to be sure it's going where it's supposed to be, uh, confirming that and ensuring that there would be no um, sea life that would be damaged during the the um, during the deployment of the pipeline. There is an existing concrete slab where the wastewater treatment plant is that this would be connected to. And there was a stairways here that went down the cliff that was my understanding was damaged or washed away in a previous storm, but there is a concrete covering of the cliff that we would be attaching this pipeline to the existing concrete slab. There would be no more attachments or anything going into the cliff face or anything, only into existing concrete slabs. So that would be rolled out from the connecting point at the wastewater treatment plant to the buoy. Um, again, uh, there would be an anchor where the buoy would be attached to. Um, uh, pipeline would be carefully placed on the seafloor using that small barge with safety divers. And that entire deployment would take place in less than a week, weather permitting. This is sort of what it would look like once it was installed. And because this is a pilot and a temporary uh, unit, um, Typically, if this was a permanent deployment, it would not be left exposed. Obviously, that's not the most lovely thing in the world, but to minimize the damage to the cliff, and as we say, just bolting it to the existing concrete pad that's covering the cliff and connecting to the concrete pad on the top, we would just be bolting it to that concrete pad for the duration of the 12 months pilot. And then if the city decided to go forward with the longer term deployment of units, we would figure something out with the regulatory agencies and the city, of course. Um, so there is a lot of maintenance and operation that goes on. Well, I mean, not that you would see things, but a lot of it is done just through monitoring that system. Although it has no electricity, we do have a solar panel. There are a number of sensors on the unit. We're constantly monitoring um, the salinity levels, the pressures, the flows. And we would monitor those continuously and do go out and do checking on the units on a regular basis. We also do a lot of, um, of, 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 of uh, automated checking. We use drones to do some checking. Uh, we do have um, our, we do utilize uh, remote operated vehicles for underwater checking. Um, so they, they can go out in any type of weather um, to do checking on the units. Um, so. Um, at the end of that term, we would propose to do a decommissioning, which would be the exact opposite of the commissioning. Um, we would obviously tow the bull back to shore. Um, we would deconnect the tension. Um, we would replace, we would um, pull out all of those um, anchoring systems and we would roll the, <coughs> excuse me, the piping back onto, uh, onto a boat. And so that to leave the area as it was before uh, we arrived. Excuse me. So where are we presently? We're presently in the process, along with the city of Fort Bragg and and local um, experts, uh, marine environmental experts, are going through the permitting process to be sure that this is safe and effective and would make sense and meets all the criteria for those 15 different regulatory agencies. At the same time, we're fabricating the unit. It's primarily fabricated and almost ready to go. We're going through the logistics, our operating team. Um, once it, it would be approved and we get the go ahead, it would be shipped to the city, mounted in place, um, hydraulic tested and deployed. Um, when that would all be, would be mostly dependent upon when the permitting would be completed. And that's really tough to put a timeline on it, just because there are quite a number of agencies that have to do approval of this, as well as the city of Fort Bragg. So um, that process of permitting, of course, uh, you know, it's looking at a lot of different things. Of course, the protecting the marine environment, um, protecting the rights of the ocean, the coast and the land use, making sure it's safe for navigation, and of course, um, health and safety, uh, water quality, standards meeting all the California uh, requirements, as well as uh, being sure that it's safe. Um, we meet all government um, required, uh, uh, check the boxes of all of those pieces. 
and making sure that we're building and implementing best practices and building, going through a process of trying to build um, strong relationships local, which is really central to our committed basis. So what studies have been conducted? Um, benthic habitat studies have been done, which is that sonar survey of the seafloor to document the area habitat. Uh, that's been verified with uh, re remote operating vehicles. Essential fish habitat assessments have been done in conjunction with the National Marine Fisheries to ensure that the project doesn't have any adverse effect on any, any federally managed fisheries. A sensitive species survey was done to ensure that the installation operation would not have any type of an adverse effect on any sensitive species in the area. Um, further ongoing species uh, studies, sorry, would be entrainment studies to ensure and verify that we are not, in fact, the system is not having a, a negative effect on plankton resources, which include fish larvae. Um, understanding the water needs, what the deficit would be what, with all the water improvements that the city of Fort Bragg is undertaking. And of course, doing um, discharge studies on the brine, empirical studies to verify um, our brine dispersal uh, modeling. So um, why go through this? What are the benefits to the city of Fort Bragg? Um, one, we understand it to help with the transition to a more sustainable water solution. So the city doesn't um, go into periods of time where there are droughts, uh, particularly during, we understand the high tourism season in the summers. I'm meeting all the alignment goals of the Blue Economy Initiatives, increasing community resiliency to climate change. And also it's an opportunity to demonstrate a, a new and sustainable technology that could particularly be utilized elsewhere in the state of California. And City of Fort Bragg would absolutely be the first and a leader in, in doing that. Mm -hmm. um, what else would be potentially beneficial? Mm -hmm. of, of course, there would be um, employment of, of locals and contractors to do the O&M. Um, there would be a training program for the folks who would be doing the maintenance of the units. <clears throat> um, with the permitting and the local agency partnering, um, I think this custom design for a specifically for Fort Bragg, and it gives a chance to look at the water needs and analysis. Um, it aids again to the community resilience to drought, and um, it provides a little bit more tools on monitoring. I mean, one of the things that we have on board that we monitor continuously would be wave heights and how rough it is at the seas, and having a, an active uh, fishing fleet that could be information that could, might be useful to the fishing fleet in making decisions when to go out to sea and so forth. Um, so, if you did have any interest in, in, in following up on the progress all the way to the left, you can sign up to get e-notifications on the Blue Economy Initiative in general. I'm in the middle. If you wanted to know more about the project, you can get information on the project website and the QR code all the way to the right um, will list future events that will be coming on relative to, to, um, to um, this, to the um, resiliency project. So I'll just leave a second if anyone wanted to do a screenshot or take the phone out to take a picture, any of those QR codes. I'll also jump in to mention that this um, whole talk will go on the Noyo Center's website within the next few days, and you can come back and get these QR codes later if you'd like. Thank you, Sheila. So that's it um, for the presentation. Um, I hope I didn't run over too long. I hope that leaves us a little bit of time to um, to. Uh, ask questions and be able to answer questions if there are any. Yeah, we have had some questions and I've let you go because I knew you were um, going to touch on some of these, but knowing that we have this marine science community, I expected um, a good number of these questions. So can you talk a little bit about um, whale entanglement and what you're going to do to us or, or marine mammal entanglement, I should say, not just whales, but um, pinnipeds, what you're going to do to assess that or and or mitigate it? So our first step is to mitigate it to ensure it doesn't happen in the first place. Our design, for example, we do have lines, we do have ropes that are there. Those, all those lines are kept taut so that nothing can get wrapped around. As a secondary measure to that, each one of those is encased in a hard piping that runs along the length of it that 
doesn't make it conducive to anything to get entangled in the first place. Uh, we do know that there are instances of, of secondary entanglement where things like fishing line can go mm -hmm. and particularly floating along and get caught on. We do monitoring of the buoys. One, there's a camera on the buoys at all time that's looking for anything that we can see from the surface. We do have a team that's going out to the buoys on a regular basis, and we are sending out even more regular than that, a drone to do a, a quick assessment, and if needed, uh, ROVs, underwater vehicles to go and do an assessment. And if we see anything, we absolutely are fully updated with the California, with the national, the NOAA, mandated mitigation policy and what to do in case there is uh, an entanglement incident, which we hope uh, in all cases to mitigate by the uh, by the design. Don't forget that you have a Marine Science Center here that can um, assist you in some of that monitoring. Thank you. One for the NOAA <laughs> Center. <laughs> okay, so on a related question, um, well, I guess, I guess, wait, so before we leave that topic exactly, so what, in, in, when you're doing your um, demo project, how often will you be monitoring? Like, how often do you expect you'll be going out and assessing uh, you know, the lines or the, the, the entrapment or entanglement, any of those things? So we do have a full-time, or we will have a full-time crew, and that's their, their, that's their role to, to um, full-time every single day to make sure that the unit is operating properly. Um, if we do see an, any or now, they do go out on a regular basis um, to, they have a schedule, as I showed that maintenance schedule. So they go out to the buoy on a regular basis to do um, some maintenance functions and to just do some checking. We do enhance that with doing some flyers with drones just to get a look. We do have ROV capabilities. We have not deployed underwater cameras in the past, but we're looking into the possibility of deploying full-time underwater cameras to this project because of the sensitive nature and because of where you guys are, are at. So yeah. uh, that's our that's our uh, primary strategy and our secondary strategy to mitigate entanglement. Yeah, we'd love to talk to you about that too because we've been doing that. We've been uh, wanting to get some cameras in the water just for some of the, some other reasons for uh, the marine habitat issues we're having. So that would be interesting. Um, okay, so uh, related. Mary is asking, how are you going to keep sea lions and birds from occupying the buoys themselves? Because if you go out in our waters, the, all the buoys are covered with sea lions. <laughs> yeah, I, I, well, you know, and actually the, the first, so the, when you saw the, the unit for Fort, um, the one that's operating in Florida, which is uncovered, um, this unit would be covered. So it would be sort of a, a slippery tough thing for anything to get upon. As I did note walking around, I did see the sea lions basking there in the sun and the rocks just off to the right of the of the wastewater treatment plant. And it did come to mind. I've definitely seen that. So we hope that the covers would um, prevent them from being able to go on. And it, it does, this second generation unit, particularly to go there, does have a railing that goes around most of it. And it does have a cover that covers the rest of it. So we're hoping that makes it unattractive as a sitting place, uh, sort of like, um, I don't know, where you see those. Um, we hope that makes it unattractive for any other pedipeds to, to want to try to go on top of the units and sun themselves. We've had an extremely active sea lion population lately that I'm sure will put you to the test. Um, Okay, Mary also wants to know, and you kind of touched on this, Sean, but will plankton get caught in the intake? I think when you were talking about the micron of the intake itself, but can you address that again? Absolutely. So the standard of design for the state of California right now, the gold standard, the only thing that's being permitted is what they call subsea intakes, which is where they design intakes underneath the sand. So with the idea being that nothing is gonna get pulled through the sand into the system. The sieving diameter of our system is less than the average diameter of the porosity of sand, the 60 micron. As I mentioned, it's about the diameter of a human hair. Secondly, we've designed these things to have an incredibly low velocity. So if you have a high velocity that tends to kind of impinge things and pull them in, our velocity is low to the degree that even things that are not free swimming, even things that are floating, tend to not get and pulled in. We will be validating this. We will be having long-term um, entrapment studies being done as part of the pilot. 
Um, and that data will be obviously made available. These will be done by third party, independent third party validation, not something that we'd be doing on our own. Um, so that's pending and we'd be happy to share that, of course. Uh, well, I think we'll be mandated, but also happy to share it. So that would be for you. Okay. Well, in a related note, Lawrence is asking if you've ever studied the survivability of plankton or eggs through the through the machine itself. Is that something you've looked at in the past with some of your other projects? We've done modeling. We've done entrainment studies where we simulate um, the pumping system and we look to see what gets pulled inside to kind of measure uh, mortality. And it's been incredibly, incredibly low. It's proved to be a very effective system at preventing things from getting pulled into the system. Okay, Jim is asking, um, would the water coming from the iceberg need to undergo any additional treatment and would the water be brackish at all? Okay, good question. So <clears throat> seawater desalination tends to be very standardized. The membranes, we're using uh, standard membranes as, as any other plant has. Um, so our operations, our water operate, our plants operating in cold Pacific waters tend to produce a salinity of about um, 350, 400 ppm, which is um, significantly below the standards of the, of, for salinity of water. Um, so as our water comes out, it meets all WHO, World Health Organization standards for drinking water, the same as any other desalination plant. We don't call that potable water. We call that um, fresh water or permeate water. Basically that water would be delivered to the city of Fort Bragg. And if the city of Fort Bragg to make that potable would essentially uh, chlorinate that water, uh, which is a requirement for public health supply waters that are being transmitted, going through transmission pipings to ensure that if there's anything inside the transmission, I mean, reverse osmosis membrane barriers are incredibly effective. They're like a log four removal for viruses and bacteria, which is 99.99% removal. So the water in terms of its efficiency for safety is, is quite high. It's, it's a very high level, but basically, Trend, converting it from um, permeate to make it into potable water uh, would be the responsibility of the city of Fort Bragg. Um, so that just entails uh, putting in some type of disinfecting, residual disinfecting product like chlorine, as you taste chlorine in any water supply distribution in the United States. <clears throat> and, um, and in some cases, putting balancing the pH a little bit uh, to give it a little, because all of the hardness is taken out and generally water that has a little hardness has a little bit of a better taste. So it's typically balanced out by running through calcium carbonate beds to put a little bit of hardness back in just because it's just all of it's gone essentially as it goes through the reverse osmosis membranes. So those are the steps. Those two additions are essentially what most jurisdictions do to go from what's called uh, permeate water to potable water. Okay, since we're talking about bringing the water in, I, I have a question I'm going to insert, but we still have some more questions from the chat. But but you so you sh showed that really interesting topography data of the of the bowl and the sand channel, and and then it stops kind of a ways off of the coast from the wastewater treatment plant. Is that where you would then follow the out uh, outfall of the wastewater treatment plant? Is that then hitting the outfall? Absolutely. Uh, okay. That's a great question. So there is an existing wastewater treatment plant outfall there that goes out and it has uh, an easement, I think, of about 50 feet on each side, which is a barren area. And it's actually a concrete uh, pad on top and we would attach to the on top of or lay on top of the, or at least that's our proposal. It would have to still being verified to, and to be okayed by the city of Fort Bragg and also the regulatory agencies. But that is the... for at least a quarter of a mile. Then you're not actually disrupting the seafloor because you'd be attaching to the infrastructure that's already in place. Correct. Actually, the the plan is to actually attach that infrastructure even for a longer period of time, and then traverse a little bit further out onto that sandy area. And how does the line itself get anchored through the sand channel? I mean, I know you've talked about this being something that you could move easily or even, I, I, am I wrong in hearing that people have said that even during high seas like we have now, you could bring the, you could bring the iceberg into shore for a while if we knew we were gonna have partic particularly rough seas? 
So it you can bring it to shore. I mean, basically, we have been increasing the survivability testing of the units. In our first instances, in our early days, when we knew we would have really bad weather, um, I'm not, well, you know, t t where we've been doing a lot of East Coast testing, where we'd say a category four storm or above hurricane, we'd bring the unit to shore. Our secondary level or our evolution was we had things that you would call a breakaway system, which is what the, the unit can be anchored to the seafloor through a storm. There's nothing that's going to damage it, but where we don't want to damage is the system that puts the power to the unit. So where it's where it's put tension to the anchor floor. So we had what is called a breakaway. So that main anchoring line would, this breakaway link would release the tension. And so it would go to secondary anchors and just remain in place. And in our third instance, we've just been increasingly through tougher storms. We've been through, um, through we've, we've survived over five meter, it's a 18 foot wave storms and leaving it in place that's been fine. Our goal here in Fort Bragg, where we know you guys typically have up to in the wintertime waves up to 30 feet high, um, we're going to test the limits of the systems, and that's one of the that's one of the role, that's one of the goals of this um, of this um, of the pilot of yeah, to that, to to really good. test those limits. Yeah, that's great. I I I think that's we will put you to the test for sure. If you've been watching the waves that we've had in the last month. Um, okay, so David is bringing up the cautionary tale that we all live with in this community, which was a, a community center that was built and then couldn't be maintained. And so he's wondering if you know what the maintenance cost per unit would be for the city for something like this. So um, good question, David. Um, generally, um, in, in this particular case, the city of Fort Bragg is purchasing the units. Um, we are providing an operation and maintenance package. We will do and be responsible for 100% of, as a subcontractor to the city, of doing the operation and maintenance. Um, so um, we have an estimate of what that is. Um, I think probably it'd be better to, if we wanted to talk about those numbers, we'd go through the city. I don't know if it, but they are calculated, they are known, and they are fixed. And Onika in this case is 100% covering them under this agreement. No matter what happens, we're responsible for the so operation. The, so the pilot project is meant to refine those numbers so we have a better understanding. Yeah. Absolutely. Great. Correct. Sure. Great. Yes. Okay. So so we have another question about the, the brine. So I think it'd be great if you could talk a little bit more about the brine, how it's, how it's expelled throughout the process and dissipated and how you're going to monitor the brine um, to make sure you know, that we have an understanding of the impacts around the, the infrastructure itself. Absolutely. So um, where the intake structure is on the system, which reaches down into the ocean, it's a little bit variable depending on the design, um, about anywhere from seven to 10 or 15 feet below the ocean surface where the water comes into the system through that intake very closely located to that is our brine discharge. So each unit has its brine discharge, which as I mentioned, comes out about anywhere between 30% to 50% maximum higher salinity than the, than the sea, ambient seawater salinity. That, that brine is released high in the water column directly at the buoy. Um, we do place in all cases We've done empirical studies for brine disbursement, and we absolutely tend to do long-term here, where we place sensors in the water over a long-term period at different uh, different uh, depths of different uh, well at different levels out from the buoy, different depths down from the bot from the buoy discharge to the ocean floor, <clears throat> and we increasingly put those out for periods of time, measuring the brine salinity to ensure that the the standard of no harm generally globally is accepted as if you are about uh, two meters, six feet away from the discharge point, if you cannot measure more than a 1% difference in salinity, and that's what we've been able to demonstrate. And that's a standard for showing that the salinity is not, uh, that the salinity is manageable and is in fact not um, harmful to the surrounding marine life. 
Very interesting. I look forward to seeing that data as you get it. <clears throat> uh, okay, let's see. We got a few more. Let's go. I think we did plankton. Um, okay, so Tony had a follow-up question to her entanglement question, which is the lines are taut. How do you deal with seas rising and falling? Well, actually, the tautness from the seas rising and falling are what supplies the tension and what a where the power is, where the power is, that's the power takeoff of the unit itself. So the unit is actually a piston as it goes up and down, that tension of the piston um, to the anchor, but it's sort of like a double acting pump. Um, every time it goes up and every time it goes down, that action is what's doing the pressurization of the, that's what's doing the pressurization of the water. Um, so in fact, that, tautness is a, in fact a requirement and in fact it's a very specific level of 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 tension that's put onto that anchoring line and in fact that's what's necessary for the creation of the pressure excellent all right so uh, <clears throat> diane asks about corrosion and how that's been an issue with desalinization and how you're going to deal with corrosion on your your system so um you know desalination is in fact a pretty uh, well-established uh, technology um, and the the piece of it that would be prone to corrosion. Um, there are materials that are known and we utilize that are incredibly resistant to corrosion, even in really high. So, in fact, it's easy and where you guys are located because your water is cold. Um, when we've done projects, not we as Omika, but me in the past and waters that are much more saline and really warm, like the Caribbean or the Gulf state areas, where corrosion is much more of a problem, it's it's problematic. Uh, but it's very manageable. Um, it's designer materials. It's continuous maintenance. Um, so it's it's like a if, if you have a boat, you know, you just got to be out there working on that boat. That's just the way it is. That's part of the that's part of the package. And um, you know, it's part of the love and the hate of having something on the water. <laughs> but it's just part of the package. So that's part of what we we sign up for. Yeah, I agree. Okay, the last question is related to the um, history of development and use of the mill site, which which has resulted in contaminants, primarily dioxins, being um, in the mill pond and potentially in the mobilizing into the water and sediments in the region that you're looking at in the mill in Mill Bay, as they call it. So, will you? I I think. Uh, Adele is asking if you guys will be addressing contaminants like dioxins at all in any of your work. Well, I mean, certainly our water, the permeate water would be uh, at least on some regular basis tested for all of those sorts of contaminants as, as a standard for, I mean, the list of contaminants that are tested for on some regular basis as mandated by California law is quite extensive. I mean, I don't know it offhand. I don't know what the contaminants are there, to be honest with you. We have done some measurements of water. We have had it tested. Um, it's absolutely safe to use the levels of all the things that have been tested for. I on that was handled, um, you know, in conjunction with uh, an external um, environmental marine company and uh, but the testing was done through a standard certified laboratory, uh, a, a California certified laboratory. So to my understanding, they have nothing has been detected that would throw up a flag that that water off the, in that area is unsafe to utilize for seawater. Or in fact, it was certified as being safe to utilize. And once it goes through the reverse osmosis process, as I've said, it's a really effective barrier to almost all things. So. Um, but it will be tested on a regular basis. I mean, you know, obviously you have to test water before you can give it to, before you can use it for anything that has a potential health implication. So that's, um, I'm not really sure. I, I I don't know the history I have. Um, I do understand that there has been some contamination um, in the past, but I really, that's, I can't speak to that. I, I would leave that um, to you, Sheila, and to Sarah. I'm sure you guys know much more, but I guess the, the bottom line is the water would be, tested regularly to ensure that there's nothing in it that would be harmful to health. 
Yeah, I, I think it's regulated pretty heavily by the regional board. So I think, yeah, the city the city already has that testing going on is is in related to the water source that they provide to their constituents. Okay, Lawrence, our last question is from Lawrence, and he's asking, um, what is the effect of kelp rafts, rafts on your on your tether? I mean, I, and this is reminding me of a question that I've had as I looked at your website where you talk about these these platforms potentially being artificial reefs and being fish aggregation devices. And so can you talk a little bit about, about that, Sean? So where we are, where we are looking at being permitted to uh, to put the anchors, I mean, it's a pretty barren terrain. I mean, if, if you look at the photographs, it's literally it's literally a sandy bowl with some urchins crawling around and not much else. Um, we do see where we've put our installations on, where the anchors are. We do see a proliferation of of sea life um, soon afterwards. Um, I really can't. I do know that there is an an active, uh, an act there, it's actively being uh, that there is an active uh, engagement to try to regrow kelp in that area. Um, it, will any of it grow on any of the anchoring systems of our anchoring systems? I don't know. I mean, we'd certainly monitor that. What would we do if that happened? I mean, I'm certainly we'd follow protocol. I'm I'm not mm -hmm. sure. I don't know. I, I understand that most of the time the, the kelp that's the most valuable typically has a particular type of rock substrate. I'm not a biologist. Um, well, that's why you have a brain science organization at your disposal. I do think you're going to get some kelp growing on yours. We, we've we seen that in the restoration sites, that, that spontaneous growth mm -hmm. of bull kelp on long lines has been something that, that has happened because the spores divert, dis, disperse what, uh, in the fall. So... Um, and as Lawrence points out, there's free floating rafts too that might get sort of in, like you talked about some of the secondary entanglement issues. So kelp could be one of those, but I suppose that just gets handled by maintenance. Um, so it'll be interesting. Like, I think that's going to be an interesting thing. We actually proposed a project just to put uh, unseated lines in the water as a kelp restoration tool um, across the floor of the ocean just to grow kelp from unseated lines because there we have seen enough spore availability in the water for it to grow on lines. So we'll see. Okay, Mark Jensen has a, a good ending um, comment that this looks like a really cool project and he's looking forward to seeing um, how it plays out. We are, I think we at the Noyo Center are also interested to see how this goes. We have our questions, as you know, Sean, we've talked to you about and um, we're um, really interested in seeing how those questions get addressed. I I personally would love to see your video if you want to show a video or two right now. Um, and then at that point, if anyone wants to uh, use the little hand raise icon in the bottom, we'll call on you to, to ask a question directly. Absolutely. Um, should we show the how it works video or would you like to see the actual um, deployment of actual units and operating? Let's see the How It Works video first. Onika Technologies mission is to make the oceans a sustainable and affordable source of fresh water. To that end, Onika has developed an all-in-one solution that uses only wave energy of the ocean to turn seawater into fresh water. This increases the resilience of coastal populations and industries. Onika's projects consist of deploying arrays of wave-powered desalination buoys off the coast. Each surface buoy is tethered to an anchor on the ocean floor. The oscillating motion of the waves is harnessed to actuate the system. As the buoy moves down in the wave trough, seawater is drawn in through the strainer and then filtered. Then, as the buoy rises with the wave, the seawater is pressurized in the pump. The pumped water flows into a pressure and flow optimization system. Then it is pumped to reverse osmosis membranes. The system has been designed so that the strainer, filters, and membranes are self-cleaning. 25% of the water is desalinated, and the remaining 75%, which contains the salt extracted from the desalinated water, is returned into the pressure and flow optimization system. 
This saltier water, called brine, which is only around 30% saltier than seawater, is then discharged back into the ocean. The fine mesh of the intake and combined with regular backwashing of the intake prevent the entrainment of fish, eggs, and any other marine fauna into the system. The system's brine has a negligible impact on the marine ecosystems. The combination of a brine concentration significantly lower than traditional seawater desalination plants and a modular system with multiple outfalls provide effective diffusion. Sea currents and wave action further diffuse the brine so that no change in salinity can be detected within two to three meters of the buoy. The produced fresh water, which is under pressure, flows to the shore in a single submerged pipeline. It can finally be stored in a water tank, distributed to the population for consumption or used in industrial processes. System performance as well as water quality are monitored by sensors powered by solar panels, and data is available online in real time. This way, Onika ensures that its water continuously meets the highest standards of water quality. This solution results as the users getting a new water tap directly from the ocean while preserving the environment. Get in touch with Onika and let the power of the ocean empower you. Um, so I want to take this this moment to thank not only Sean but Sarah and everybody at the city for um, pursuing this project. I think it will be a really interesting one, not just for our community but for the rest of California to see if we can do desal in a much more environmentally sustainable way. Um, we look forward to seeing this happen. I, I've invited Sean and his team to the field station at Noyo Harbor. Um, to bring the technology when they do the deployment, when they get through this permitting morass that they're in right now, and they're actually in the deployment stage, we'll bring it down to the harbor and have a public event so you can see the technology before it gets uh, deployed as well. Um, and they're they're excited to do that. So keep to mm -hmm. keep keep, in, um, keep keep updated with us through both the Noya Center and the City of Fort Bragg's website and. Um, Sarah, is there anything more you want to say about? We want to talk about your survey. Any of that? Oh, so sure. Thanks, Sheila. So for those of you uh, that have heard or not heard of the Big Noyo Harbor planning effort that we're doing, um, we're kicking, we're looking for volunteers. That's my first pitch. But it's the kind of volunteer that all you need to do is what you normally do. Live your life, have your friends, and you're a conduit between your social circle and the city so that we can get all different kinds of perspectives in this planning effort. So we're spending three years looking at climate resiliency from the vantage point of Noyo Harbor. So we're collecting baseline information on all kinds of things, social, um, I mean, economic, um, sure, social, why not? And uh, environment, sea level rise, tsunami hazards, aquaculture feasibility study that we're partnering with the Noyo Center um, to work on. All of this has a project site um, that I'll tell you about, but if that sounds interesting to you and you wanna work with me to help connect your community to this project, reach out to me directly at the city and I'll tell you more about it. Um, also, in so with that said, beginning in February is when we're launching um, all of our outreach. We have built a, a website. We're gonna be delivering um, surveys, different newsletters that are topic specific, working with Noyo Center on science talks um, that are, relate to this project. So this is just kind of a soft launch telling you all about it now. Um, and we're gearing up for February. So um, not much to do right now, except check out the project website. It's noyooceancollective.org and stay tuned. There is an e-newsletter um, that you can subscribe to. So if you just wanna click on that website and do the e-newsletter, we will be presenting all of the progress of the Onika project specifically, both on that website, um, you'll find an Onika page, but also through the city standard website. So lots of ways to get involved and um, thank you for thank giving me a chance to plug that, Sheila, appreciate it. Yeah, no problem. Okay, so Sean and Sarah, both of you, thank you so much. And Sean, um, 
We will be watching anxiously as this project develops, and we hope we get you back for another science talk when you get a little further down the road. Um, but thank you so much for spending your time. I know you're you're ready to go to bed now. He's on the East Coast, so um, thanks so much for for an informative presentation. Our, our pleasure, and Sheila and Trey, thank you guys so much for uh, providing this platform, and thank you all for attending. And Sarah, thank you so much for um, City of Fort Bragg. You guys making this happen. So. Thank you all, and I hope everyone has a great e rest of your evening. And yes, I'm not too far away from hitting the sack because it's uh, <laughs> 10 15 here. So. All right. Thanks, everyone. Don't forget to, to support the Noyo Center or your favorite nonprofit. We all need it. So uh, enjoy the rest of your evening. Bye. Thank you. <laughs>